Pensado's Place is brought to you by Avid Vintage King Recording Connection Ozzy, U2, Pearl Jam, The Cure. Our guest has done it all. We've got a brand new ITL. We've got some programming notes. You better believe it. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. Yeah. Great job from the interns in terms of suggesting it. Yeah. An even better job in snaring this incredibly diverse guest that we have who has just the names I mentioned at the top of the, of the top of the show. My God, yeah. Tim Palmer. Thanks, man. Hey, great to be here. Pleasure, pleasure, <laughs> pleasure. Um, we had been talking for a while to get you, talking yeah, to folks who you work with, and uh, the scheduling worked out, and we've just been sort of giddy ever since, correct? Yeah, Tim and I exchanged some emails about, what, eight or nine months ago? Yes, that's true. A yeah. long time ago. Yeah. yeah, we did that interview together right. ever since then. Right. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Where were you going to start, Dave? You had, some, you had a quote? Uh, yeah. You can move on and evolve, but you can't change your haircut in your high school album. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, I got several Tim Palmer quotes, but that's my favorite. And, and I, I, it's so indicative of how you approach records you know what i'm saying you have a little bit of the past but not enough to make you think it's retro you know it's a modern record but you always respect the past uh can you expand on that quote because i love it. it's one of my favorite of yours well as you said it sort of encompasses a sort of theory you know just about the idea that when you make a record you're reacting to that moment mm -hmm. and everything that you're hearing on the radio and everything that's come before you and you respond to it you, you make the story play out the best you can but you can't overthink it mm -hmm. and sometimes if you're part of a, a genre or, or a, a time period like the 80s or whatever mm -hmm. you make decisions based upon that and later and I know that from my own thinking you look back at some albums you do and you think oh dear right. you know, what, what was I doing there but you know the fact is you can't go back Right. and change these things and they are you know those decisions were correct at that moment or at least mm -hmm. you feel they were mm -hmm. and I think it's silly to sort of base your life around the, that concept you know of, of trying to always mm -hmm. go back and change things because you've got to let it go and move on and do something else that's better you have to keep and, moving forward don't and you? I you know that quote as you probably had guessed I was for a while you know some of the guys from Pearl Jam after we made 10 which was probably one of the mo most successful albums I did they said, you know, Anybody we did, we wish yeah. we wish that it had been less reverby or oh. less delays, and <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, this was an album that we made together, and that was what we did, and it did pretty well, I thought. I'd say it did well, okay. You know, and yeah. you can't go back and just constantly think, oh, well, let's just do it again in another way because you're messing with it, and I don't think you need to do that. Yeah, I think that hindsight is not always twenty twenty. No, sometimes it just it bogs you down, and you go, you know, I think because if you don't sometimes disconnect the cerebral side and just follow the intuition side, yeah. that's when you find those moments. So don't exactly, you think? and as I said, they're marked very much with the time period. That record, when we made that record, it was a very interesting transition. We were leaving the 80s hair bands. Mm -hmm. they were, the sound on the radio was big, powerful rock records. Mm -hmm. Suddenly a band like Pearl Jam come into the fold and Mike played very traditional solos which was acceptable to rock radio. They loved it because right. here's a band that's new, but they still have some old. And then the way the record sounded, it was still a big sounding record. It still mm -hmm. had a lot of depth. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a hard, it was like a stepping stone over. Mm -hmm. Because if we'd gone hard in with like, you know, the, the, the sort of Nirvana dry thing, it would have been a lot harder to accept. Right. This was a nice way of walking over, I think, into the new, mm -hmm. into the new era. Mm -hmm. And um, well, that, that you know, record defined the, the Seattle grunge sound. Uh, probably a little more so than the, than the Nirvana record. I know people are going to flame me for that, but I think it actually defined the sound a little more. Don't you think? Well, it was a lot of... 14 it, million copies it was, had to do something. Yeah, it was a, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, we did a song every day, the band came in in the morning, we made the changes that was required, we were working very instinctively, we didn't overthink it. Yeah. The, the fact that there was no expectations of the record was a massive yes. part of it because we weren't second guessing every move. We're like, okay, that sounds great, let's do this, let's do that, move on. Yeah. You know, when you get a, the second album, was probably a whole different story. Absolutely. It, it becomes was, harder. You know, they expected small sales. Yeah, exactly. And one, you know, that wasn't in the plan. Right. Right, right. Where did you mix that record? Oh. I mixed that on, on, on a big old Neve, a, a studio called Ridge Farm, which was in the countryside in Surrey. Mm. They all flew over from Seattle, and it was, mm. it was great. Nice. Wow. It's great, because nice. it was one of those, like, the 70s 
get your head together in the country. Vibe. Yeah, exactly. The band are all <laughs> exactly. in one place. You all eat dinner together. Exactly. You know. Exactly. It, it was the just good great. Old days. Yeah, the it was great. Uh, w w tell me about your home situation now. Your your project studio. Well, the project studio now is based in Austin, as you mm -hmm. can tell from my accent. I'm a of Texan course. now, cool. and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to be a Texan. It's a wonderful place to live mm -hmm. in Austin. Uh, the people have been super nice. Uh, there's some great engineers that I work with, and it's just a great situation. And my studio was built out of the fact, I'll be honest, of the way the music industry changed. And, you know, I, I, I hate the idea of compromising and having to sort of cut short my thought process because of a budget, yeah. as everybody yeah. does. Yeah. I mean, we're all in the same situation. So having my own studio was, gave me the opportunity to say, okay, I'll take that budget and I will be able to spend as long as I want on a mix to get it right. In the way that you want In the way that I want to, rather than if I spend another couple of days in the studio on this, I'm, there's right. probably nothing going to be any left for anybody else. <laughs> right. So, so uh, you know, I built this room, um, which is a separate structure in, in my house, and, you know, I don't have too much gear, but I have the right combination, I feel, of a sort of hybrid. Mm -hmm. I, I, everything goes through an analog chain. Um, my signal path is very important that it goes through that analog chain, but at the same time, it's very recallable because obviously being remote in Texas, if I'm dealing with Larry Klein in LA, I have to be able to get back to a mix and make those adjustments and it'd be right. So my faders control the Pro Tools. Everything goes through the NL chain. I've got some GML and stuff like that as outboard, but I'm doing a lot of stuff within Pro Tools. Mm. And I, I can't say that I don't like it because I really do like it. Mm. Mm. What, um, in terms of your process and, and the way you work, obviously things are different now than they were Philosophically, what, what, what has changed about the process now? Is, is it more, more creative, more freeing in terms of how you make records now? Well, it's a bit of everything. I think it's a little bit of everything. I mean, the, I find that the internet sort of gave with one hand and took away with another mm -hmm. because, you know, obviously it destroyed our source of revenue through CDs because everyone got the music for free. But at the same time, it gave us the ability to send music. Mm -hmm. And I'm working with music now from all over the world, which yep. I could never have done before. And yep. it's simple to do. And the Pro Tools, obviously, the technology Absolutely. has given us that. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's changed quite dramatically because when I started out, the, the role of the producer was everything. Mm -hmm. It was right from hearing the songs, saying, look, I think we need to work on the arrangement of this, pre-production, recording, setting the mics up, yep. you know, right through to the mixing. And now we have so many subsets. The specialists for everything. Yeah, you have guys that just do vocals, yep. guys that do loops. Yep. And, um, you know, it's a whole different way of making music nowadays. Now, that's, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just different. Mm -hmm. we, and I'm not the sort of person who romanticizes heavily in the past, although I have a lot of, you know, tools in my arsenal that I learned from going through that analog phase. I, I can imagine your high school album photo wasn't that good, so I can see yes, why you oh, would right. go back to it's the past. <laughs> we used to have one of those cameras. You know the cameras that move around slowly? Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. we used to have one guy who'd start at one end, and as soon as his picture had gone, he'd run round and appear on the other end, so he'd be on both sides of the school <laughs> photo. <laughs> I love those. <laughs> I like that idea. But yeah, no, it's, I, I, think, I think we're in a good place. I mean, you know, because of the smaller budgets, producers now, I find, are not necessarily able to spend the time that we did back in the 80s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as a mixer now, I find my role is often doing way more than just mixing. And, mm -hmm. and I don't mind that because I find it actually really fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you'll get a session in and you'll think, OK, well, maybe if I could just grab this guitar and, and maybe double it quietly or add some percussion here or, you know, and then the bands are, are very open to that because yeah. all they care about is making a great record. Yeah. And I, I say to them up ahead, look, if you don't like what I've added, there's a mute button. Right, right. It's going to shut down. Right, but exactly. They're happy that somebody's mm -hmm. prepared to take that extra time. Well, yeah, sure. And, and you can do that now, which, of course, in, back in our day, doing musical changes, that moving stuff around was very difficult to do Absolutely. and very expensive to do. Absolutely. Now Absolutely. you can make huge changes. Mm -hmm. uh, Blue October 7th album, uh, Sway, Bleed Out. I, I, I want to discuss that song, and I want you guys to check it out. Not right now, um, because I think it embodies pretty much everything I like about what you do condensed into one song and mix and, and production. Um, pretty spectacular job. Thanks. I love the way you took, I don't think anybody does this better than you, uh, keyboards and guitars, like rock guitars tend to not be enhanced by adding keyboards, but, but you do it in such a way that it makes the, the guitars bigger. Right. And especially when that chorus comes in, I'm like, oh my God, I saw stars when the chorus came in. 
break that down for me. I know it's a conscious thing on your part. Well, it's very, very nice of you to say so. Um, I mean, I, I tend to sort of think of all the, the parts of the song in, as, you know, the jigsaw puzzle. And it's irrelevant to me whether it's a guitar or a keyboard. I, you know, like us all, the first thing I do when I'm presented with a song to mix is I try and figure out what is the redeeming quality of what I'm trying to achieve here. Is it, is it a groove thing? Is it a vocal performance? Is it a lyric? And that really sets the tone, I think, to how you approach that mix. Mm -hmm. um, in that particular song's case, like you said, the chorus was very dense. Um, so I actually, for that particular song, to get the most from the equipment, I started at the chorus because I wanted it to peak, everything to peak at that point. Mm -hmm. And then I did the verse after, which is not something I usually do, but I knew that if I'd started at the verse, by the time I'd got everything to lift the way, that, like you said, then I'd have had no headroom left. So oh. I started at the chorus and a lot of it was making choices as to, you know, because they had recorded a lot of stuff. It was recorded by David Castell and he'd done a great job, but there was plenty of choice for me. And maybe sometimes I had to think, okay, well, I won't use that just yet. I'm going to start with just these elements and then bring them in. So there was some selection there. The bass on that chorus was very important because it had a very 16s fast feel. And it was quite a task to sort of figure out in the stereo image where everything was going to lie. And a lot of that is literally, you know, spending the time to say, oh, I'm trying this here. No, that doesn't work because that's answering that particular rhythmical aspect. I'll try it this side and just fiddling around, you know, until mm -hmm. you find how the hell this is all going to mesh together mm -hmm. without sounding too dirgy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was a program bass, so it had a very strong low end. So that left a lot of space between the two things. But, uh, you know, it's... Uh, what was... The, so, so that sequencer part I'm hearing in the, in the, the hooks, that, that's... The bass part? No, that's programmed, the chorus, you see. It goes from a played part to a programmed part. And the played part was interesting, actually, because a little trick that you, I'm sure Dave knows, but I often use now with stuff is, you know, when you're given a bass that doesn't seem to fit in the way uh -huh. that you want it, you bring it up twice, knock the phase out, and fade it up till it disappears completely so you have no signal. And then you put your EQ in, and then you just select one frequency only, and you take the EQ out. Uh -huh. And only that frequency will appear. You know this. Yeah. One. Mm -hmm. So and that that sort of I was able to rebuild the bass in the verse to sort of tally up to the chorus part. And there's no other bass in the in the hook besides that sequencer bass. I don't think so. Although I can't I can't remember exactly, but it was a lot of it was is very dry. I love that from, sequencer part. Mm, it's cool, and there's why. distortion on it, and it's a soft synth, and you could you know. The, it reminded the, me of Eminence Front. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's like. It's like rock songs shouldn't have sequencers in it, but when you heard Eminence Front, you go, okay, I guess they yeah. can. But that's the great thing about these soft synths, isn't it? Because you open up the session, it's there, so you want to give it a little bit more edge, you can just adjust the actual mm -hmm. part itself. Mm -hmm. um, there's some echo throws. I, I can't remember, the. it's, it's near the end of the first verse. Um, they sound kind of radio-y, and they just, they just they just leap into this little space that you left. Do you right. remember what you did? Was it was it? I don't like remember exactly. Sound toys? It sounds I, like sound toys. I'm your worst person for all that stuff. I love all that. I, I play around with that stuff forever. Delays, reverbs on delays, distortions, things like that. I mean, that's what I really enjoy to do and sometimes probably do it too much. But, you know, getting that three-dimensional thing of getting some moving delays and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I often, you know, start with the whole vocal track and then just go through, listen, make some notes and think this place, this place and this place were mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. And then just do it like that, you know, um, just selecting the parts that are cool. Um, distortion I use a lot on vocals underneath just to bring out that yeah. harmonic overload. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's an what old do you trick. use? I use, um, basically, I use um, any sort of thing in the box that's just like a guitar distortion unit and I often nudge it back a little bit be so that it's not mm -hmm. phasing I prefer it to, to so you hear the clarity of the vocal right. and then you hear the edge and the harmonics after so I'll nudge the distortion behind it you know a lot of people think that the power in a rock song is is or some types of songs comes from the guitars but you use the vocals to give a sense of power and and you can take a song that probably wouldn't be considered a hard, hard song, but because of what you do with the vocal, you make it hard. Much like Robert Plant could just take a, a mandolin and make a heavy metal song with a mandolin. 
one of the techniques you're using is to do that? Is that this, dis this distortion that you're well, yeah, making? I mean, I, I, I tend to be one of those people who, you know, it's in the, in the 70s and 80s, people put an effect on a vocal and left it, and that mm -hmm. was the way it is. I tend to see the song very much as separate pieces of the puzzle, so I might treat the vocal in the verse completely different to what I do in the chorus, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I know a lot of this is not rocket science, but that's definitely the no, way I think of things. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll very categorically say the chorus needs to be angry, distorted, let's tuck the yeah. distortion in, let's have this particular slap on yeah. it. And then the verse may be a completely different chain, mm. channel, compressor, everything. And I, I find it works so much better to tell the story that way of the song. Gotcha. Um, yeah. are, you, are you double compressing the vocals to yeah. keep them in your face? Oh, I mean, every song's different, depending on what the source uh -huh. material's like. But I often do, yeah. I'm, I, have a, I often have, nine times out of ten, I'll have one of the Anna tape simulators on there. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have Is that a, first in your chain? No, it's like second. I'll start off with an S, the SSL channel strip, oh, which okay. I love. With some fast attack, just getting rid of the uh -huh. sort of extremes, a little bit of EQ, then a tape simulator. And then I'll often, um, that, that chain goes through my system. I have my own separate vocal channel, with, which has a Tone Lux EQ on that. Because oh. uh, I love the Tone Lux system. And I use the Tone Lux EQ for the high end. Mm -hmm. And then I also have a Tone Lux compressor, and that has the blend on it. Mm. So you can hammer it. So basically you're paralleling. Yeah, so you're hammering it on one side and just blanking the blend. And it, it, it seems... The compressor in the, in the SSL, you're just kissing it. Yeah. Like a, like yeah. a ratio, like two to one? Yeah, it's maybe just... Maybe knocking yeah, not much a dB? It, not much, yeah. A couple of dBs, something so like that. So you're just trying to make the, the Tone Lux compressor happy. So you just yeah. kind of keep it from having I mean, to work it's, so much. You know what it's like? It's like playing around. I mean, I tell you what I do a lot of now, which since that new update to Pro Tools, is being able to control the waveforms and cut in and move things up. I do a lot of work where I'll run through the track and I'll look at what I've, what's been recorded and so the compressors are working more consistently. I'll do a lot of the, the donkey work by raising the waveforms. Uh, clip and gain. That, yeah, you know, so you the clip gain, exactly. And it makes a massive difference. Yeah. Because, you know, you sometimes the compressor's not screaming for mercy because uh, you can back it <laughs> off, you know. You know, that's cool that you say that because I kind of I kind of think in terms of, of them being live people and making them happy. I, yeah. I, I always try to say make them happy. Yeah, but, that's true. But screaming for mercy, that's, that's, uh, that's some Monty Python stuff yeah. there. Well, actually, that's some... Given your sort of attention to detail, do you... Is there a preference you have between mixing and producing? Um, well, recently I've just really enjoyed mixing because... I've got so much control over it, yeah. and as I said, people can send me stuff, and I can play on it and help them. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, that doesn't apply across the board. Um, some of the artists I work with, I wouldn't touch. I've just sure. been working with Larry Klein um, on a couple of projects, and he, the way he's been working on these particular projects is surrounding the artists with the most amazing musicians, yeah. like Booker T. Jones, wow. and, you know, and Dean Parks, and mm -hmm. classic musicians, and when it comes to mix those, you have to imply a whole different... It's a different mindset, yeah. correct? Yeah, because I'm actually thinking, no, I can't boost things up on the mouse. Right. Because it's too jagged. So I'm really going back to using the faders. And, and it's, it's, it's been really fun, you oh, know. Great. And it, you have to approach it in a completely different way, but mm -hmm. very enjoyable. Well, see, I, and I think, you know, you and I talk about this all the time. <clears throat> when somebody's passion is that evident, it, it, you, see, you feel it in the record, don't you? Like, you're... You care about this, and, and it shows, and, it, and it's great. And don't you think that, I, I think it's hard to be disconnected and get passion into a record. You have to have passion yeah, I to think inject the, passion. The people that you work with sense that. And yeah. I think that, you know, for young people who are starting out doing this as a career, I mean, more than ever now, the concept of doing a great job, you repeat clients are where it's all about. If people see that you really put in the extra effort and do a great job, they'll come back to you. Yeah. Because it's not so much about the old school ways of A&R men with the favorite people. That's right. This is another world that we're another in world. now. Another and you world. And you have to be prepared to, to go the, the whole nine yards. And you also have to not let technology get in your way. Mm -hmm. You can't have that remove the part of you that's human. Of course. There's so many tools now that you've got to see through that and then bring yourself to that. Of course. And have the tools enhance that. Absolutely. You agree? Absolutely. I yeah. totally agree, yeah. I like the way you said this, the song will tell you what it needs. You, you don't have to go do a whole lot of thinking. Just listen to the song. And it'll tell you what gear to use, what to do with that gear, and, 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 and how, to, how to enhance the song. Another thing I love about what you do is your guitars always sound big. Um, some of them are recorded that way, some of them aren't. On the, um, we'll talk about the hymn song, um, Low Love, and, and I love the guitars on that, but the guitars on Bleed Out, 
Were, were, were they stacked? I mean, I, yeah, there's a lot of stacked things. They'd recorded arpeggios and different octaves and things like that. The so, hook guitar is one. Yeah, in the chorus. Yeah, I mean, on the on the hymn record, it's a whole different approach altogether. Well, let, let's talk about uh, bleed out and then go straight to um, no love because I, I, I love no love too. On on bleed out. Um, the, the main rhythm guitars in the hook, how are they stacked? Like, like, like a, a, through a Marshall or something like that, one pass and another pass a little cleaner and you use the virtual a virtual amp on? There's a, there's a combination of usually about two or three things. Um, they're not a, a, a metal-y sort of rock band, so there's no big sort of power rocking riffs. That's, it's not that mm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. There's usually arpeggiated melodies that mm -hmm. are going through that are played and there's delay on them and chorus on them and they're sitting in certain spots. And then Justin, who is the, 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 the singer of the band, he plays guitar as well. So he provides a sort of glue to it all. He plays a lot of octave stuff and it's sort of dirty and you can sit that in the middle. Mm -hmm. But it's just about playing around with it until it makes some sort of sense, you know? Gotcha. Um, you can open things out very wide in the chorus. I tend to back them in more central in the verses. Mm -hmm. And let You're the keyboards, panning yeah, panning-wise, and then let the keyboards be wider in the verses, and then bring the choruses, I bring the guitars back wide again. But, you know, hmm. that's interesting. Cause I would, I would have probably done the opposite. Yeah. But I, I like the way yours sounds. I might Sometimes steal it, that yeah. from you. Yeah. Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because it's like the obvious thing was always with guitar bands and stuff is to kick the the big ambient drum room in on the choruses and that. And I found sort of the opposite works so much better. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in the verses where it's open, that's where you use your room mics and you shut them off completely in the choruses because you want all that space that's taken up by rooms being the guitar with all that energy oh, okay. right into the front of the Is speaker. Is that what you did on Bleed Out? Yeah, uh, well, I, I do that sort of on a lot of things, actually. Hmm. You know. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I'm sure you did. Yeah, <laughs> we're friends, man. You should have shared that with me a long time ago. I could have been somebody. Well, I guarantee you he's going to use it, so just <laughs> pay attention to his record. Oh, I'm leaving in about five minutes. Yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> on, um, on No Love, what a, what, a, what a great job you did on that. Great track. Great track. When you got that track, how were the guitars recorded on that? Because I love the guitar sound. And then take me through the mix process. Well, the, that, that, this is a band, once more, like Blue October, that I've worked with for many years. I worked with them first on an album called Love Metal, which sort of, that name sort of describes their genre. They kind love, of made that genre love, with that yeah. name. And um, Vila, the singer, who's a big fan of the show, he was the oh. one, he actually told me about the show oh, before. Cool. Cool. Tell him we he, said hello. I like will. him too. He, um, you know. He's from Finland, her. Yeah. Cool. Cool. The, the other producer in Finland is a guy called Hilly, and between the two of us, we back and forth. I'll make an album, he'll make an album, I'll mix it. We did one album together. This particular album, Hilly had recorded it, and they'd spent a lot of time on those guitar tones, mm -hmm. playing with all sorts of old amps and whatever. So that was a case of when we mixed it, it was about you know really looking at what they'd done. We're not adding anything or doing anything particularly clever with soft synths and things. It was you really working with what they got. So. The first thing Vila did was he said to me, I don't want you to work in your own studio, which was bizarre. Because he said, uh, yeah, I know you're really comfortable in that room and you know the monitoring and you know how to make things sound good, so let's go somewhere else. Mm. <laughs> so he wanted to, he said, he said so I wanted cool. to take you out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So we went over to London, which was nice for me, you know, go sure. see the family. And um, we worked at Alan Mulder and Flood's oh, studio, wow. which was fabulous, you know. And it was strange, actually, because for so long now I've worked out my room, going back and sitting behind a huge SSL board. Sure. And, uh, you know, we worked pretty fast on that. Um, the guitar, what we tended to do actually, which is strange, is we, when we got close to being correct, or we thought was correct, then we would sit there and keep turning the guitars up louder and louder until we went, well, that's silly, and then go back one. So we'd finish it and then turn the guitars up. It was weird. So that's why the guitars are pretty up there on that stuff. They're um, perfect. But there's, there's a big wall. I mean, the concept was, you know, making a massive sort of, um, Black Sabbath-y type of wall of sound, yeah. you know, and uh, but at the same time you can, as Ozzy always used to say to me when I worked with him, you know, rock and roll's about the bass guitar, man, turn the bass up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so the bass is never left behind because that really, with a lot of rock records, it is about the bass, you know, you can forget it, but mm. it's all very well cranking the guitars, but you need that low end to I'm go. I'm not on sure I agree with that. Yeah, no, well, that's what... Give a second here, Herb, help me out. Um, I, I love bass, no doubt about it. It needs to be there. my records, that's what they're always there, but I... I also, don't forget that, the, you know, with that, remember there was that, somebody did a survey many years ago about the way that men and women set up 
their car stereos. Did you mm. ever read this? Yeah, I read that. And, and women boost the low end, mm -hmm. and men boost the high end. Yeah, and okay? they actually do which that. Is, which is, makes sense, right? Yeah. I, I, I used to tend to do that and still do. So, you know, if you want the women to like the album as well, you can't let them go short on the bass, Well, right? that's reason enough. There you go. That so is. if you want to <laughs> cross over all the genres. I'm sold. Cool. <laughs> you can't leave the bass um, behind, man. I need to check your mix later tonight. <laughs> I always joke with bass players, nobody listens to the uh, bass anyway. <laughs> on a song like No Love, you, you, you turn up the bass and you got all kinds of train wrecks, though. It's, it's, everything is so dovetailed and just fits together so perfectly. I, I'm going to have to think about that one for a minute. Because hmm. maybe what's throwing me off is turn it up. Uh, it, uh, I, I would say put it where it needs to be. Well, of course, yeah. I know what you're trying to say. <laughs> okay, I'll let that go. The synth and <laughs> Thanks, the verse. <laughs> such it's my gracious, show. Such a gracious <laughs> host, didn't he? <laughs> uh, here again, the way you the way you can combine powerful guitars and synthesizers is just it's, it's a textbook in, in in mixing right there alone. That verse synth. It's just so beautiful. Do you remember what that was? I don't do. I'll be honest. I Probably when you got it, I mean, it was already done, but... Yeah. It was just... I mean, I think the 80s was a great learning time for synths, and then when the guitars all came back, you had to figure out a way of making it all work together, you yeah. know? And yeah. a lot of, I, I did a lot of sort of alternative gothy-type bands in the 80s, like Gene Loves Jezebel and mm -hmm. The Mission and The House of Love, and, you know, it was very layered and very textured, and we started to add keyboards in as it went along further and further, and uh, uh, it was a good, you know, a good learning experience mm -hmm. for me, mm -hmm. as is any of these sort of situations compared to, you know, just getting in and making records with all different types of musicians and genres. Yep, yep. I mean, we're students forever, right? Every well, time you work on an album, you learn something you new. You learn something new. Speaking of that, the regionality in, in which you've recorded and produced and mixed, you know, London and LA and Austin, have that provided you sort of different learning curves? Has it just been the times? Is it? Moving to America was very different, That's of course. That's a big step. Um, just because of the type of people that were you know, there was a very positive, I felt a very positive energy around the music business when mm. I moved here 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Moving to Texas, I'm, I, you know, the only thing I miss about my setup is I do miss, you know, having a chat like we are now. And, sure. And, and when you're mixing things, it was always fun when there were people in the room and you mm -hmm. could tell a few stories and have a laugh and, yeah, and, and you get things done, and you get things done like that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Nowadays, a lot of the time, you know, you never meet the artist at all. That's right. And wow. I find that really weird. I mean, I did a record last year with the Polyphonic Spray. Yeah. And they allowed me to add quite a lot to their music, and it was a wonderful experience. And the first time I got to meet them was I rang up the, the singer, Tim, and I said, you know, the, you know the guitar parts I play. Can I can I get up and play with you guys? And they said sure. So I first time I met them, I got on stage, put the long robe on, no all these robes, and played oh, what I played cool. on the record. And ah. it was so weird that wow. to me. But uh, that's the way things are going. You know, you don't yeah. meet these people. We have a lot of that, right? We we just don't meet clients. And, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. We're, we're pretty good about skyping and. Well, we we try to at least get a picture of the. Yeah, we institute a conversation <laughs> at least, just so that there's some connection. Right? Yeah. You uh, can find pictures of you, Dave, if you look. <laughs> <There's> a few <laughs> no, around. A picture of the artist. <laughs> it's amazing how you can have the, the a picture will kind of give you help in deciphering how the mix should go. This, you know, I'm you a think? big believer like you are uh, that the song kind of dictates what it needs. I think but so, yeah. The song is, uh, is, is everything, I, uh, isn't it? You know, female artists, a lot of times, I, I like looking at the picture because it kind of helps me. Like, if, <laughs> Careful. Like, well, no, if they got a lot of piercings, if they, if they got a lot of piercings, and, <laughs> I, come on, guys, if they got a lot of piercings and stuff, you mix it one way if they if they've got, you know, a lot of I, I find with music that sometimes I hear a song on the radio and I absolutely love it and then I see the video and, and I don't like it anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't want to see what people look like sometimes. It's mm -hmm. funny that. Well, there's a little too much dependence, I think, on yeah. a visual and its yeah. relation to a song. Yeah. It, when, you know, we grew up, the song exists in your head. Yeah. And you put your own visual to well, it. It's like a movie in a book, isn't and it? And it lasted you get forever. A, you, get a move, you get to read a book and you know what the leading character looks like. Absolutely. And you see the movie and Absolutely. It, it'll let you down. Now yeah. other people take that away from you and they yeah. interject something, so it's a, it's a different way of thinking. One of the neat things about the No Love record is I came to that project, uh, especially the new record, mm -hmm. um, Tears on Tape, I came to that thinking of them, I don't know why, but as a metal band. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it might, might have been Metal Love or something, but but then when I heard this song in particular, it was a single, I'm, I'm halfway through it, I'm thinking, God, this, this is a pretty cool metal band. They got a lot of melodies going on, they got a lot of harmonies, and then I started realizing the way you mixed it, 
did you intentionally try to confuse me? Because it, <laughs> it's a metal band, but nothing in the song sounds metal. The drums don't have that, that high tick on the kick drum. The, yeah. the guitars don't have that, that real boosted presence that, that, yeah. that metal likes. Um, I think it's just that that, that band have a very signature sound. You know, they do that thing and they do it extraordinarily well, I think. And, you know, I, I know we talked about this before, but when I was mixing that particular song, and this is uh, something that happens to me often when you're making a record, is you'll start thinking, I'm killing it on this song. This is great. I'm, I'm, I think they're going to love it. I'm really happy with the way this is going. And, and then you realize, well, actually, it's a great track. And it's a great performance. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you realize that, you know, that's really what you're that's responding what it to. Right, right. It's because this is one of the great tracks, you know. Yeah. And um, when you're working on a whatever song it is, if you're working on suddenly you come across that key song that, that often takes the band to the next level, suddenly you find that you have so much more creativity with that song because, yeah. because it's great anyway. Exactly. So it's great with the drums loud, it's great with the guitars loud, Absolutely. and it gives you a lot of, you know, it gives you a tremendous opportunity to do something special. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. a song that isn't so great is actually defined by the fact, oh, well, it sounds great, yeah, but that doesn't really not, mean that. That doesn't mean it's a great song. But if it's a great song, <coughs> you know, a lot of my favorite songs don't actually sound that good anyway. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. I love your quote. The best cure for a bad mix is a good song. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. It is, though, isn't it? You, you know what I mean, Dave, right? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. um, of course. <laughs> we won't elaborate on that. Um, so let me ask you a question, sir. How is yeah. your arm? Is it loose? It is very loose. It's batter's box time. Can you uh, pitch a few our way? I'm trying to remember where I put it, her. Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, dear. So are you ready to... Uh, Bat Tim, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Just round the bases. Just keep going. <laughs> Throw out the first pitch. Let's make it happen. Guitars. I love SM57s Ooh. and 421s. There we go. Vocals. Vocals. SM58. Give me a plug-in. A plug-in for vocals? I, I, you know, I often keep going back to that SSL channel strip. Okay. Mm -hmm. Overheads. Overheads. 87, U87s. Reverb. Reverb, well, I mean, either plug in or the real thing, of course, but I love the EMT plates and I love the um, 480 lexicon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Snares. Snares, well, once again, I'm going with a 57. It's the classic. I mean, Okay, so that doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count as a, you can't as, have it twice. as a candidate for your island gear. Give me yeah. your, your piece of gear, one piece of gear you take on an island by yourself? Well, I, I probably, I mean, this is on the assumption that you're mixing on the island. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I would, Don't we are? Because if we were not mixing, I'd probably take a, big, I'd take a big sound panel and sleep on it. Yeah, exactly. If we're gonna, or a razor blade yeah, from when we used yeah, to chop tape <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to cut some fruit. But no, if we're thinking of mixing, I love, I love those um, tape simulators, like the DAD tape head simulator. I use that all over mixes. Mm -hmm. I think it's the most valuable plugin that I use. Mm. Cool. Bass. Um, my favorite basses are a precision or a jazz. Mm. Give me a plug-in for bass. A plug-in for bass. Um, there's a particular plug-in that I was, I read, believe it or not, on Frank Filippetti's Facebook, mm -hmm. and it's a frequency responsive EQ that tracks the notes of the oh, bass. Oh, yeah. And I forget the name of it, but mm. it is phenomenal. Hmm. I, I you know just, what I'm talking I, yeah, about? Yeah, I do. I just told Cole about it. You can it. actually see the notes that are playing. It registers yeah. them. And if you find that frequency that's a little bit sort of cloudy, it'll track it. And it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's fairly new. It just came out. Uh, good one. Cheapest gear you ever used on a hit record? Um, well, can I change it for most expensive? Yeah. Okay. Um, many years ago when I was working um, with the singer from Kajagoogoo, mm -hmm. it shows you how old I am, um, the, key, the percussion player on the session was a guy called Martin Ditcham. He was very good friends with Mitch Mitchell from mm -hmm. Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, oh, Mitch has got Jimmy Stratt at the house. I can oh, bring it wow. down. Oh so God. he brought it down to the studio you and we all had a go it. and we put a couple of chords on just because you had to. Sure, right? you have to. And he left the session with all his percussion and left the guitar behind. And we literally had to ring him up and say, Martin, you've left Jimmy Stratt. <laughs> and that's the same Stratt that was eventually sold by Mitch and it was eventually went to the CEO of Microsoft, and it's allegedly he paid two million for it. Oh, wow. I heard that. For a strat, right. that's wow. pretty good. That's a pretty good that's uh, strat. I changed my mind. You can't do that. Document for that uh -huh. one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cheat on your behalf. Okay. Guitar pedal. Um, Memory man. Oh wow. Synth. Um, Mellotron. 
Okay, here we go. Last one. Stereo bus. Stereo bus. I always have the GML stereo EQ. 8200. 8200 and a little bit of SSL compression. Am I allowed to? Like an Allen Smart or the... Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Did great. Uh, well, no, 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 wait a minute. You got to subtract for the, for no, the most expensive. I did. And he still beat me? No, I don't know. If he, yeah. <laughs> no, I probably didn't. Well, he, the beginning was solid Louisville Slugger stuff. Hold on. And a then second. he switched to an aluminum bat. Judges? Halfway through. I thought I'll transition no, no, something it nicely. <laughs> remember that? <laughs> I am the judge. Yeah, I know. So there's no way to look around. <laughs> By the way, speaking of judges, let's introduce our man in the corner office, Chong Gore. Chong Gore Gons, my How's it going, man? late night strategist. How are you? Very, very good. We yeah. definitely have the, the late night sessions. You got some questions? Yeah, we got a bunch of them. This first one's from uh, Cuba Malejko. With you two is all that you can't leave behind. How was the work process and where was most of the time spent in those two years? Well, I was only involved in that at the mix stage. So I can't say that I know everything about what went on before I got involved. But I spent a long time working on those mixes. And it was quite, it was a fascinating process to be surrounded by all these people that I've admired, you know, from, from Daniel Lanois and Eno and yeah, Steve right. Lillywhite and sure. the whole, you know, the massive amount of people that you're working with. But um, I started in LA at Larrabee, actually. Mm. And it was quite interesting because I, the first song I mixed, I think, was Stuck in a Moment. Oh. And it surprised me because they sent a mono track of drums. Okay. And I thought, wow, what do you do here? Because it was very important for me to get this first mix sort of right because I might not have got to mix any more. And this is often, as you know, when mm -hmm. you're a mixer, you don't know what your parameters are to how far you can push it. That's right. But I thought, well, I. I wondered why they'd only recorded a mono track, especially with the technology we have today, because you can record a lot of stuff and don't use it and hide it. But anyway, I was faced with this mono track, and so I immediately added some shakers, left and right, to give it some sort of stereo image. And then in the chorus, I added tambourines and things like that. And then I fiddled around with some mutes and stuff. And it, you know, this was just the beginning of the process because they were excited by what I'd done, but then it was okay, now can you come to Dublin and we'll carry on. Oh, so I'd, I'd already done a couple of days. So it was a, it's a, a long process. And for them, you see, listening to a mix is just a way of finding out how well they're doing at this point. Because yeah. often you can mix a song for a week and they'll go, that's what we need to do. And you'll hear them downstairs and they're recutting the song. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's just the way they work. And it's, it's amazing that, wow. I mean, I've never met a more of a hardworking bunch more hard than I would ever want to work. I'd say it's too much for me. But no, I, it was a it was or a wonderful a bunch with a bigger budget. Yeah, it was a wonderful Chandler. experience. Oh, hold on a second. The the mono drum track was it recorded with one microphone or was it bounced down mono? Well, I, I, I can't I can't tell you that because it was it was just on one track and the, but I, it you sounded like one mic. Really, one mic on all the drums. Yeah. Chongor, what you got? Darren James, what's your philosophy on compression? Uh, well, we touched on that earlier. I mean, compression it, you can use it as a leveling tool or you can use it as an effect. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, a lot of the records that we've made in the last few years have been overly compressed, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, depending on the type of music that you're doing, if it's a rock song and you need that voice right in your face, then you can go to town on it, have two or three compressors if mm -hmm. necessary. Mm -hmm. Other songs where you want a natural performance, like the stuff I've been doing recently with Larry, you know, they've got a great tone. There's a lot of dynamics in the music, so it allows the dynamic in the vocal. I mean, I think this is something that we forget about with music, is, mm -hmm. is leaving the room for the singer with auto-tune when everything's brought to this thin line of perfection in tuning in mm -hmm. every instrument. When the vocalist goes to sing, if he goes a little sharp, it sounds awful. Right. In the old days, when everything was a bit looser and a little bit less tuned, the line for him to sing on was this it wide. Just felt like so when he sang yeah. and he went sharp, it was cool. Right. If he went flat, it was a little cool because he had a thick line to work with. Mm -hmm. When we draw everything to this thin line, I think it's, it loses. And it's the same thing with compression. You know, it's, every song's different. Hmm. Gore, one more, please. From Jonathan Evans, when you receive a song to mix, what's your workflow and what elements do you start with first? Once again, it's different every time. I mean, the first thing I generally do is get a cup of tea and listen to the rough and make notes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that time that you spend coming up with your, you know, your sonic vision mm -hmm. or whatever it is or how you feel the song is, is, is very important while you're fresh. It's like when you listen to demos for the first time, I always think write notes the first time you hear it because mm -hmm. you start to like it for all the wrong reasons if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. So those, that's the workflow. Start with that. And then, as I said, if it's a, if it's a vocally driven song, 
you know, it might be important to get the vocal sound right. Who knows? If it's a rock song, you often start with the drums and the bass, you know. I mean, it changes every time. I mean, the key to it is to not allow yourself to have a, a, a method that draws you to the same conclusion every time. It's to let yourself do different things, I think. Hmm. Two, two questions for you from me. Um, one, we're in some discussions about coming down to Texas and doing something. If we come your way, would you join us in what we're going to do? I'd love to. We, great. We, we tend to draw a, a pretty Austin good crowd. Austin welcome we you. Fun. Yeah, and we, we sort of avoided South by Southwest because it's so crazy, but we think coming at another time. I think that's a really smart idea. Giving some people. Absolutely. It would be great to be on the panel with us, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it'd be yeah. fabulous. Second thing, too, is um, Dave and I, we don't, we don't tell this publicly, but generally the, the, the partners that we have as sponsors, we tend to sit with them as people mm -hmm. to make sure that they're the kind of people that we want our audience to meet and they mm -hmm. have the kind of integrity and stuff. Um, we've recently, and I've spent a lot of time, um, gotten involved with Recording Connection, and mm. we're enamored of the guys, um, the peer-to-peer -peer teaching philosophy that they have, who they are as people and their yeah. vision and stuff. You, you know them well. Give, I do. Give, give I, us your sense. I, my sense of it is that um, I've known Brian for quite a long time, and he, told me, he called me and told me about his idea for schooling. And to be honest, a lot of the recording schools I find are very expensive and teach you a lot of stuff that isn't very necessary and also don't give you a lot of the tools that you require. Yeah. And Brian's concept of being you know, a mentor-based school mm -hmm. where you're actually with the people that are making the music. I mean, you know, watching Dave on the phone dealing mm -hmm. with a client right. is something they're not teaching you it's in invaluable. school from a textbook. That's right. And those sort of things are part of our jobs. as That's much right. as, And, you know, knowing how to run a session mm -hmm. and, how, and, and, and seeing for yourself really what it's all about you know, one-on-one -on -one is invaluable. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's why I like the school, is mm -hmm. because they offer that to, their, to, you know, to, 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 the, to the students. We, um, uh, for Jimmy and Brian, who we've gotten to know pretty well, mm -hmm. um, the boxes that they checked off for us was that. Um, <clears throat> the fact that you didn't necessarily have to go any place from where you are mm -hmm. to go learn. You can learn almost in your hometown or relatively yeah. close. That their pricing was reasonable. Very that reasonable. their placement effort was significant. Um, and then they just passed the gut check stuff, right, for, for you and I. And, mm -hmm. and we're pretty careful about that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So, so me guys, let me, let me just tell you this. We're going to get you and in, in, in teach you some more about Recording Connection. Get to their website. It's brand new. Um, these are people we like and we sanction a bunch. We got some big plans in the future. They actually made sure we could do the Nashville thing. And, and um, I'm glad you're involved with them. And I'm so glad you did our show, Tim. Oh, thank you we very much for that. Did you have a good time? I had a great time. It goes fast. Thank but you. It really does, doesn't you. it? Absolutely. Dave, take us home. Okay. Whew. All right. Um, I'm going to go watch this episode as quick as I can. I know you guys are going to learn a lot. Tim's uh, someone I've admired for a long, long time and um, borrowed quite a few things from him. <laughs> so it was great to see him in person. We'll see you next week. Thank you.